All right. Uh, I'd like to say, John, that I actually am a millennial. So. Yay! We got one. We got two in the room right now. <laughs> All right, well, I just want to start off by thanking the Heartland Institute for having me here. You know, I was very honored to be asked to speak on this panel. Um, now I'm a little worried, though, because I have to follow up uh, Tom Harris and John Coleman, and that's not an easy task, especially after that, after that talk. But uh, I'm a relative newcomer to this debate. I was a child when Al Gore and Dr. Hansen were first pushing this in the late 80s and 90s. I remember the hype being a kid, going to ecology club meetings, hearing about how fossil fuels were going to ruin the planet, and, and that continued my whole life. And when I, start, when I came to DC and started doing reporting, I was kind of unwittingly thrown into what Michael Mann has called you know, the climate wars. And so a, bit, a little bit of what I want to talk about today is my experience um, being a reporter and having to cover these things and kind of how it's changed my view um, from being kind of a blank slate and just kind of assuming that what I had heard as a kid was true to becoming definitely a lot more skeptical of all of these claims. And then I, I want to go into, you know, things that, like, people can do to really understand the issue and look past the talking points or the press releases or what the mainstream media puts out. Um, so I've been reporting for the Daily Caller, mostly covering energy issues for the past three and a half years or so. When I came in, I was thrown into energy reporting. I had no prior experience doing it. I had no clue really how coal was. <laughs> how early. I didn't know that coal made up, you know, 40% of our electricity supply. I thought, like many, uh, most Americans actually think that it comes from nuclear or something like that. And... I started just simply as a regular energy reporter, reporting on, you know, things like oil, gas, fracking was a big issue to start off, and, you know, the so-called war on coal. And as I started to look deeper and deeper into the regulations, and I started reporting on the things that you didn't hear about. You always heard about the EPA regulations coming out and how many lives this would save based on their ecological statistic models, or you know how many how many how many emissions this would reduce, or how many asthma attacks this would present, and I started looking into you know well what about the coal miners? What about the people who work at the power plants? I started seeing things like well won't this impact electricity prices if we have to replace it with wind? And as that I kept building that and that until. You know, I started looking more into like, well, what about these green loans that companies are getting? And I was fortunate enough to break a big story about a solar company in Colorado that had been taking green loans and knowingly making solar panels that regularly caught fire when people would install them on their roofs. And the government knew it too and didn't cut the funding off until the Congress discovered about Solyndra. And I was also fortunate enough to be you know, a reporter and working with the Competitive Enterprise Institute when we found out that Lisa Jackson actually liked to go by the name Richard Windsor well, at the EPA. And things went on and on, and I started, getting in, I started getting more and more into the actual science behind climate science and uh, the climate change debate. And looking at, especially when I started seeing ridiculous claims like that, you know, no one, no one in their right mind could really believe, like that st people were coming out and saying global warming was causing the war in Syria or ISIS. And there's, I don't think there's anyone who can readily, it had nothing to do with, you know, the, the situation with the Assad government or anything like that. It was all because of climate. And then also things like the European Union wanting to force U.S. passengers over U.S. airspace to pay a uh, carbon tax for traveling. And um, it, it was after all this reporting that, you know, I started noticing that every time I'd report on something, you know, really far left-wing media outlets would come out with reports against me, like, you know, to get Media Matters, Think Progress, all these people. And basically, I think the consensus among the left was I'd fallen in with the bad crowd and one of those ringleaders was Anthony Watts, who's sitting up here right now. But I'm glad to be in that crowd. <laughs> so, you know, I really, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what 
exactly, you know, I told you my experience. So what exactly is like the mainstream media narrative? And if you hadn't guessed from the first two speakers, the mainstream media is not exactly that friendly to people who are skeptical of global warming because they believe they have this idea that all pol and it goes back to really kind of the days of Rachel Carson and uh, uh, Silent Spring and kind of even before that just the strain in progressivism that big companies are kind of the bane of society and now it's gone from being big banks to fossil fuels industries and the common narrative that you see in the media is fossil fuels versus green, uh, green groups and these helpless politicians and regulators who are just beholden to their interests, their big moneyed interests. And so what do, they, what do these companies do? They funnel money into quote unquote denier science or funding denier groups like the Heartland Institute or, you know, the, you know, ALEC or something, you know, these big scare groups, which aren't actually scare groups, Jim. <laughs> And what's the reason they do that? It, it's purely profits, make money, making it rain like the guys in this picture. All right, and so it's the David Goliath narrative. And these are kind of the headlines that you get going from as far left as Mother Jones talking about BP funding Jim Inhofe. And actually, this information wasn't even correct. I went and looked it up. And this is the Guardian fossil fuel firm still bankrolling climate denial lobbies because all the fossil fuel companies want to do is push false science and you know all the people on the right just want to take their money to push false science it's just this there's a disconnect and then you know you even get the new york times which is supposed to be you know a, a credible media outlet running a hit piece on willie soon over money that he supposedly was taking to promote uh, bad science which you know after that came out, we, it was pretty much proven that the New York Times article was very misleading. And, you know, the media also, too, routinely uses talking points pushed by environmental groups and the Obama administration. And, you know, you have carbon pollution, and now we have, we went from global warming to climate change, and this is my personal favorite, is climate chaos, because it's just... It's just out of whack. It's warming, cooling. We have polar vortexes and the hottest year ever. Ugh. Um, you know, climate denier is a term routinely used. A reporter with the, a reporter who wrote the hit piece on Willie Soon with the New York Times wrote why he calls climate skeptics deniers, and I thought that was kind of telling. Actually, my real favorite one is climate-induced extreme weather. That is the new. Uh, tagline for any kind of hurricane, storm, uh, tornado, snow even, that hits the U.S. That is just, that is the line now. And, you know, you know Tom was talking about how to get your uh, pieces published that maybe to shift the debate, but it's hard. You know, you have climate scientists and environmental groups who refuse to go on and debate people on air. You, or even in writing or in the media. I mean, recently uh, the head of the climate policy at Center for American Progress refused to debate Mark Morano from Climate Depot on TV. Like He just wouldn't show up to the interview. If you remember a few years ago when uh, on Stossel uh, you had Roy Spencer go on and Gavin Schmidt refused to be on screen at the same time as him. And then it just doesn't even stop there. You have the BBC ordering, you know, telling their reporters and editors not to give equal time to skeptics because it's not representative of the overall debate. Well, you know, skeptics and the minority views generally aren't, you know, <laughs> representative of a broad consensus. But still, there are valid points that need to be said, and there's never just one side to a debate. And this is the job of the media that they're avoiding. And then the LA Times, you know, soon after followed suit. They would not publish letters, letters to the editor anymore that denied man-made global warming or even really questioned it. But, you know, after my years of reporting, I found out that it's, the media narrative is pretty much wrong on the climate debate. It's a lot more complicated and nuanced than they want you to think. They don't want you to see exactly all the facets of the different uh, facets of the arguments. And, you know, John said there was a couple billion dollars in funding a year. That's just the tip of the iceberg. 
Really, the White House reports that they spent, federal agencies in 2013, spent, spent $22 billion on climate change related activities from everything from climate scientists, climate science, green energy, there's grants coming from the EPA, loans going out from the DOE, and to fund great companies like Solyndra, which I think their office is now occupied by Elon Musk's company, which that could be a good thing or a bad thing for him. Um, but, you know, it, it really kind of destroys, when you have $22 billion a year, and this is just coming from the government, this does not count private, uh, private interests that are funding this too. You got to remember, Al Gore has become, what, one or $200 million in net worth since he left the White House. <laughs> you know, he was, I guess he was broke like Hillary Clinton after he left. But, uh, so, and then also you have the GAO report, a recent one, Obama spent, they spent $30 billion on 34 green energy and alternative vehicle projects, five of which has, have defaulted already. And that actually, that list is less, comp there are more comprehensive lists out there. There is, they, the government doesn't actually know how much it's spending on all of this. They've tried to calculate it and they just really don't know. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, that doesn't even count the private influence. At the top you have guys like Tom Steyer from San Francisco saying he's going to put $100 million into elections to fund climate deniers. You have a new Republican guy who wants to do the same or to stop climate deniers too. And then you have the Billionaires Club, which is, you know, a big Senate Republican report that came out that details the, the tens of billions of dollars behind in big foundations that fund these green groups. All right. So... With my, with my last remaining few minutes, I want to talk about, you know, things that there's, it's one thing to be in the media, but it's another thing to, the real debate, it, it's not a scientific debate, it's an ideological debate, and I think that's a good point that's been pressed here. And it, it really is going to be furthered by people knowing the issue and knowing how to argue and knowing how to read through the talking points. So one thing is very critical reading of the news reports or even other like just government reports or environmental group reports that you see. What's not being said? When NASA puts out a press release, are they saying, and say it's the hottest year ever, are they saying with how much certainty that they're making that guess? You know, how do they, how do they frame things? Do they use words like carbon pollution? Because that's a pretty good indication that there's going to be a big bent in it. Um, who are they interviewing? And, you know, another great thing is most of this data is public. You can just go look it up and you can see how they've, how they've changed it over time or how they're just wrong. Um, and you can read the studies yourselves. And I think the most important thing I found is follow the money because, yes, there, are, there is money on both sides. I still have not gotten my fossil fuel check, but I will look at the mail when I get home. Um, just kidding. But, you know, there, it's a very nuanced issue. And... There are money, there's money on both sides, but there's a lot more money on the left than they're admitting. And so here's some examples I think of just really obvious uh, ways to like read through. I was mentioning uh, NASA said it was the hottest year on record, 2014. Uh, and this, they quoted Don Webbles in the University of Illinois saying, we can safely say it's probably, which already right there, you kind of know, maybe it's not a certain statement, it's probably the warmest in 1,700 and 2,000 years, and I think it's probably safe to say 5,000 years. Well, Noah actually forgot to mention in their press release, which they did talk about in a press conference, but not in the release that most people read, that it was really only a 38% chance that it was the hottest year on record. And, you know, they don't mention that if you're in a pause, pretty much every re year is going to be at or near record. This is another one that I think is the mo one of the most pervasive in that this is something where the media just took these researchers at their word. And this is promoting the Obama administration's clean power plan. And there's been a few panels here that have talked about, touched upon uh, just how sweeping of a regulation this is. And all of a sudden, the study came out, you know, as it's about to be released, that, oh, guys, it's going to save 3,500 lives a year, you know, uh, at the median. Um, and the authors really made a, made a point to stress that the EPA did not participate or interact in the study or with the authors at all. And it was just a coincidence that the researchers' models so closely mirrored what the EPA had in their regulations. And they said they had no competing financial interests. 
Well, luckily there were some people who were FOIA'd and looked around and looked at the EPA grants that they've given out. Oh, wait. Uh, the, all the authors combined had gotten some $45 million in EPA grants over the past few, over the past like decade or so. And a lot of these guys were very, very, they're buddy buddy with EPA officials. But the most pervasive thing is they actually did talk to the EPA. They were regularly consulting with them and asked for, discussed the methods for our next set of analyses with them. I don't, I'm no like I'm not a lawyer, but that sounds to me like interaction, and <laughs> and you know there is hope though because like I said I think the public is the most important part of this, and it seems the public still is largely I think skeptical of the most catastrophic claims of global warming, and th it's usually about this. It doesn't really hover. It, it depends on the year, but it doesn't really hover more or less above 30, 30 something odd percent. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.